Well, hello, friends, and welcome to this evening, afternoon's conversation, which I think is going to be a blessing to all of us on Blackness, mental health, and faith, a conversation across the waters. Um, we are going to really try to answer the question, how does Blackness shape issues of mental health and faith with the diversity of global Blackness and global Christianity, issues of theology and mental health become even more complex. And the two people that are going to help lead us in this conversation today um, is a leading disability and pastoral care theologian, John Swinton, and a womanist process theologian and mental health advocate, Monica A. Coleman. This information is... I think important at our time. So let me introduce them more fully. This is a part of a conversation that was supposed to happen in 2020, but because of um, COVID-19, we seem to say that a lot, because of COVID-19, it didn't happen. Uh, it was going to be the keynote for the Institute for Theology and Disability in 2020. And now, um, with great hopes, it will be in June 2022, 2022, hosted by MTSO. So this will be an ongoing conversation that those of us who are in, at MTSO and those joining us will likely uh, continue, uh, not just in this hour, hour and a half, but in the hours to come. Dr. Monica A. Coleman is Professor of African Studies at the University of Delaware and an ordained elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. She works at the intersection of faith, culture, and social justice. She's the author or editor of six books that focus on the role of faith in addressing critical social and philosophical issues. Her memoir, Bipolar Faith, A Black Woman's Journey with Depression and Faith, received the Silver Illumination Award in 2017. Her book, Making a Way Out of No Way, A Womanist Theology, is required reading at colleges and universities throughout the United States. She speaks widely on religion and sexuality, religious pluralism, churches and social media, mental health, and sexual and domestic violence. And I just my aside to this is bipolar faith is a go-to over and over again. Just want to say that. Uh, John Swinton is professor in practical theology and pastoral care and chair in divinity and religious studies at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. For more than a decade, he worked as a registered mental health nurse. He also worked for a number of years as a hospital and community mental health chaplain alongside people with severe mental health challenges who were moving from the hospital into the community. In 2004, Dr. Swinton founded the University of Aberdeen Center for Spirituality, Health and Disability. He is the author of a number of books, including 2020's Finding Jesus in the Storm, The Spiritual Life of People with Mental Health Challenges. MTSO is, we provide these uh, theological commons um, so that we can be in a wider conversation. We are a theological institute that provides education and leadership in pursuit of just, sustainable, and generative world. So join us in this conversation as I invite uh, Dr. Uh, Monica Coleman first. And I will tell you, if you want to see um, a running live um, closed caption, go down to the bottom of your uh, Zoom and on your, should be on your right hand side, it says live transcript, click on that and you'll get to see the running transcript of subtitles for the speaker as they speak. Dr. Monica Coleman, Dr. Swinton, welcome to MTSO via Zoom and thank you for being with us. So thank you for having us. Um, I wanted to speak just a little briefly on how I got into this work and why I approach it the way I do. And then I look forward to a rich conversation with my colleagues. Um, 
for me, I started thinking about, I'm a theologian. I'm trained as a theologian and as a philosophical theologian, um, which means that I use the ways in which we think about the world to understand how we understand our faith. And so in that framework, I wanted to begin thinking about mental health challenges and depressive conditions in particular, which also led me to disability theologies. And I kind of find myself between two fields, disability theologies, which were looking primarily at physical disabilities at the time that I started doing this work, and then reading in pastoral care and counseling. They were doing a lot of the work of psychology and religion or mental health and religion, um, but not quite as a theologian. So I wanted to kind of merge those two in my own work. And John Swinton is one of the other people who does this incredibly well. And so of course I began reading his work and I thought of mental health challenges as a sometimes disabling condition. And as many people will tell you in disability studies that this is a kind of an area which we might not always think about if it's not taught to us or on the top of our minds, but fairly universal in the fact that anyone can become disabled at any moment. <laughs> and many of us live with all different types of disabilities that we might not even think of that way until they become difficult for us. But it doesn't mean they're not there, right? And that if we live long enough, we'll already, we'll also be in some ways in a world of living with disabilities. And so for me, this kind of work was intriguing and really something we didn't talk about enough. And I wanted to think about what, what does that mean? Because I believe that theology matters and that what we believe matters and that there are beliefs that are more liberating than other beliefs. I'm a liberation and womanist theologian too. And so I was like, well, what we believe about our minds, about our bodies, about God and the world and God's involvement in the world makes a difference for how we understand mental health challenges and how we live with mental health challenges. And in the US, many of our stories are always going to be raced because of the ways in which race forms and shapes the United States. And so as I was telling my own story, I realized as in any process theologian will tell you and most narrative theologians will tell you as well, it's hard to tell your story without telling someone else's story. It's hard to tell your story without talking about those with whom you're in relationship with. It's hard to tell your story without telling the context of your story. And so as I was telling my own story, I realized I was also telling my family's story, the story of many of my friends, and a story that I felt was of, I wanted to feel like a distinctly African-American story as well. And even when it had its own notes of being an American story, and then also hopefully a broader story. But I wanted to feel like it was grounded in some of the specificity of my experiences, which are culturally African-American and to begin to break the silences that exist, particularly in um, communities of color around mental health. So merging all of those together in um, this more recent work and beginning to have more and more of those conversations about the ways in which our faith sometimes hurts us, but also can heal us as we live with mental health challenges. Thank you, Dr. Komen. Dr. Swinton? Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here to talk about uh, an issue that's really important, and it's, it's a real pl pleasure to be with you, Monica, because uh, I, I'm, a I'm a fan of your work, and I, I, but I also think you're a very good thinker around these issues, and I've learned a lot over the years, so I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, I'll tell you how I got into the whole thing. So my background uh, originally was in uh, mental health nursing. So I trained as a mental health nurse and worked with there for, for a number of years. Then I'd retrained and worked as a, a nurse with people with uh, what's now called intellectual disability, but which then was called mental handicap, which then is called learning disability, which tells you something. When something's constantly changing its name, you've got to look at the, the politics of that. So all of my formative years, uh, I've been with people who see the world differently. You no know, people who live with depression, people living with schizophrenia, people living with profound intellectual disabilities, see the world differently. And then when you hang around with people who see the world differently for long enough, you begin to see the world differently yourself. So as a theologian, I was shaped and formed by that experience. So when I went into uh, uh, academia in the, uh, when would it be? Uh, the early 90s, probably. Um, I had all this with me. I had this, these different sets of questions, these different ideas, these different perspectives on what it means to be a human being. 
uh, and I did my, my degrees. And then I did my PhD uh, on schizophrenia and friendship, looking at the relationship between schizophrenia and Christ-like friendship. And that was really, really interesting because schizophrenia is one of these conditions that's highly constructed by society. You know, we have all sorts of weird images about split personality, about violence and all these things, all of which are, are simply uh, mistaken. Um, and yet we have this group of people here who are negatively constructed. So how do we respond to that? Well, we respond to that with Christ-like friendship, a friendship that offers the, um, the gift of grace and love not because of who you are, or just because of who you are, not because of what you do or how you feel, or what it is, but it is just simply because of who you are. And I think that that graceful friendship has kind of stuck with me over the years. That's why it's probably important to, to most of the things I do. But central to what I did in my, my PhD thesis was think about the biblical concept of shalom. You know, so we use the term shalom a lot, well, many of us do. And we're trying to think, you know, it's, it means peace. And of course it does mean peace, but it means peace in a very particular way. It, 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 the core meanings of, of shalom is justice and righteousness, holiness. So justice and righteousness sit right at the heart of what a biblical understanding of what health is. What it means to be with God and to be in relationship with God is to be focused on justice and righteousness and to learn to live in the holiness of God. So to be healthy is to be in right relationship with God, right relationship with one another and right relationship with your community. So a biblical perspective on mental health doesn't really look at simply look at symptoms and, and, and things that go wrong. It looks at positive things. It says, what is it that makes you healthy? And it's, and it's that connectedness, that sense of being and belonging in the midst of, even in the midst of the difficulties you encounter. And so when you think about that, uh, that way of thinking about what health is, you can see how racism and you can see how the kinds of issues that we're going to be talking about today destroy shalom. They're the exact opposite of what God wants for human beings. And so that idea of health, moving towards shalom, I think is a, a helpful way for us to be, to be thinking about what we're talking about today. And so that's the orientation that, that I have, and that's kind of how I came into it. And then obviously, as I move through my academic career, I've written a lot in disability and mental health and stuff. But that core idea of friendship, love, grace, and shalom really is formative for me in, in a number of different ways and, re and remains so. Well, thank you both for um the beginning of this conversation. I have so many questions already <laughs> in my own head, but I'm gonna start with the questions we kind of uh, agree with. I just wanna say, I, I like the notion of grace fields friendship uh, as a way of bringing people into connectedness and, um, and, and what it means to think about Dr. Coleman, what the world, how we are interpreting the world. Uh, in the name of, usually, uh, particularly for Christians, in the name of some divine or ultimate ground of truth, to use that phrase, some divinity, um, as if our humanity somehow is not also shaping that thinking. So, so then I think the question that uh, that we already kind of agreed to talk about is begged by by both of your opening statements, which is as you think about what it means to be human, we said that this is a conversation about blackness, mental health and faith. What do you mean by blackness or brownness or whiteness? What do you mean by those terms? Um, I guess I'll begin and talk a bit about it in the context of the United States, right? Because we know that Blackness is different in each society and culture. Um, so because of the way in which slavery was constructed in the United States and because of the um, early end of the transatlantic slave trade in terms of the importation of, um, I guess you would say, newly enslaved Africans into the United States, the ways in which the United States slave economy was able to maintain an enslaved population was through the one drop rule, which meaning that if anyone had one drop of blackness in them, they were designated as black. 
right? So, um, because that's the only way you can kind of grow an enslaved population that does not have new enslaved Africans coming to it, which is different from other parts of the Americas. And so the one drop rule set up a somewhat binary um, discussion of race in the United States um, that is not nearly as biological or phenotypical as one might expect it to be, right? And so in that sense, you know, you have kind of blacks and whites and at its worst, honorary blacks and honorary whites, <laughs> wherein other, you know, non-black or non-white races fit. We all know this is problematic, but this is in some ways still a very governing way of understanding race in the United States. Um, for, so for me, blackness comes out of that experience, right? Um, out of the experience that is particular to those who are descendants of the US slavery system. Not to say others aren't black, but in terms of the way in which I employ it in my work. And in terms of when I use the words African-American, I'm usually referring to those who are descendants of the US slavery system. Of course, anyone else who comes in or lives in the US is automatically subject to that same system, whether that's true in their home of origin or among their own self understanding, right? So blackness is, the double consciousness that Du Bois talks about is, of course, we know who we are ourselves, our own cultures, our own families, how we think of ourselves, but holding that in com concert with the understanding of a world that sees one as Black, what, however one is mixed, right, or however one came to that. So I usually think of Blackness in that sense, but as I often share with my daughter, with whom I'm always explaining race, because of course it's a little nonsensical, um, it's also about your culture. It's also about a shared history, right? It's also about practices and, um, and the in customs, right? So for me, Blackness as a culture, right, includes that not just the color of one's skin, but that shared experience of oppression in the United States based on this one drop rule, which is, like I said, a little bit phenotypical, largely but not wholly phenotypical, is the way in which I'm talking about Blackness in our conversations. Yeah, Dr. Swinton, I, I have something to say about that too, but I'm going to hold it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think, Monica, you, you're quite right that blackness shifts across cultures and means different things. And I think, you know, Britain has been deeply uh, um, embedded in uh, a history of slavery. It manifests itself perhaps differently in terms of racial trauma, but we can't get away from the roots. Slip. But there's one interesting thing uh, that one way in which we could think about, there's actually two things I wanted to raise. One way we could think about blackness is just a general sense of being unwelcome. Now, if you, know, if you think about um, the Afro-Caribbean community and that, 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 that community that I'm a part of, you know, in the, you know, in the 50s, people were invited across from um, Trinidad, from Jamaica, from, from uh, uh, what was then called the West Indies, to fill in jobs that uh, British people didn't want. Uh, and so people came across, great immigration, and of course they came across here and faced mass racism, faced terrible situations, treated very badly, discriminated. So you get that sense of, we call you over, we welcome you, but if you come here, you're unwelcome. And I think that's, that's, that's to me, is what blackness feels like very often in a British context. Even though the history is maybe different, that sense of un unwelcome, that sense of unease is, is complex. But I'm interested in, in also in, in what you're saying about one drop, blackness, um, which I think I always think very interesting. Because I think about myself, so I'm of mixed heritage. So I, I, I actually went for a, a DNA t test not so long ago, and I discovered this. I discovered that I'm 50% um, Scottish and more or less 50% Afro-Caribbean, right? So I'm right down the middle black, right down the middle of black white. But if I speak as a, a black person, you know, people will listen to me and they'll acknowledge me a, 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 as a black person. But if I was to stand up and speak as a white person, people would just look at me and say, what is he on about? Like, um, and yet I am both of these things as a mixed heritage person, but it's the blackness that people see. So people don't see beyond that and people frame it in that way. And I've noticed recently uh, that I've become a black professor. So for years and years, 
I was just uh, John who studies, you know, disability in Jesus. Um, but recently I've become a black professor that's asked to talk on, on black issues. Nothing wrong with that at all. Like, but I wonder what's changed culturally that suddenly I have become representative of something that, at least in my professional capacity, I haven't been represented previously. And I think it's to do with George Floyd. I think it's to do with Black Lives Matter. I think it's to do with a raise in consciousness, the significance of, of the importance of, or, or the significance of blackness that begins to manifest itself in, in uh, uh, the way that people see one another. So that sense of uncertainty, that sense of anxiety, that sense of unwelcomeness, which of course has significant mental health implications because I'm not alone. <laughs> Many people feel that way. And when you're thinking about the root causes of anxiety and depression within the black community, you can begin to see some of the roots of that. I think that's part of what I wanted to kind of point to Dr. Swinton and Dr. Coleman. I, my grandchildren are uh, uh, Afro-Latina and Afro-German. And uh, my granddaughter who's Afro-German is many years German, like her grandparents, her, her parents, uh, I mean, her great-grandparents, her, her great-grandparents both set, migrated to the U.S. as Germans, her grand, then her grandparents, and then her mom, and then, of course, my son, who's a mutt. He's not, he's not fully African. He's uh, uh, Afro-English and with Creek Indian in our family, right? So we have proof of that. <laughs> we, 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 we have proof of that. And, but I do think that for all of my grandchildren, I don't think my children thought of it as much, but for all of my grandchildren, they feel the anxiety of the multitude within them which I think is what you're talking about, uh, Dr. Swinton. And I wonder if you can speak to that. I think they know themselves as Black because they live in a world in the USA where that's the only way they are seen, period. But I think they feel the anxiety of the multitude within them. Can you speak to that, either of you, both of you? Well, I'll say one brief thing. I and mean, that's actually very, very interesting, Valerie. Um, I was having a conversation a couple of weeks ago with my friend, uh, Anthony Reddy, who's a, a black theologian who does a lot of good, really well, excellent work. Uh, and he was saying one difference he notices between the UK and uh, the US is that in the UK, it's possible for him to have multiple identities. So you can be lots of different things in lots of different contexts. But when he goes to America, he tends to find himself simply having a single identity as, as a black person, which he, which maybe indicates something different with the two contexts. But he points out that that's a difficult thing to do because a lot of the a lot of the issues we're talking about are identity and homefulness. You know, for for uh, mixed heritage people, uh, where are you at home? Are you part of the black community or part of the white community? Are you accepted as a, a citizen in your own country or are you always seen as an outsider even though you've been there forever? So that, that cultural distance, dissonance and that sense of ambiguity about your identity is a tricky thing to live with. My kids, uh, I've got, uh, I was gonna say hundreds of kids, I've got 500, I've got five kids. Um, and they're much, they're, much, they're much more black conscious than, than I ever was when I, the, the, the year. Um, and they see themselves, they're, they're mixed heritage as well, but they see themselves firmly as black. They would never see themselves as white and they're, they're comfortable to sit in there. Um, but they, they, like all of us, do have this, have that, that dissonance about your identity. And I like the way that you framed that just now, that we, we carry our history, we carry a multitude of histories within ourselves. And sometimes untangling that as we try to find our identity can be very complicated and difficult. Yeah. I mean, in many ways, ditto, right? I mean, I also see it as the way, you know, we we have multiple identities in so many ways, right? And what um, white supremacy does is flat that, right? I mean, and that's part of what makes it work is that it, it seeks to flatten your identities when we all know ourselves to be fairly complex, right? We might know ourselves by our gender at certain moments more than others, by our sexuality at certain moments more than others, by our cultural heritage, right? So even if I had percentage-wise, as much as one can do that, right, more non-Black 
blood, right? I mean, there's so many problems with blood quantum, as we know. Um, that's I'm not culturally white. Like I don't, you know, like my culture is really, really. It's not just African American. It's like Southeast African American, right? That's where my people are from, which is a little bit different than say like Texas African American, right? I mean, so it's not like we don't have subcultures within our race, right? And so I think um, part of what makes, you know, I think intimacy with God so important in terms of both race and mental health is that. Um, at least I believe, and it's an important concept of my theological framework, is that God knows us as we know ourselves, right? Not just as the world knows us. The world is always going to know us in part, but God is one who knows us as we know ourselves. And that's a deep and really needed level of intimacy. That's, that's a good transition to what do we mean by mental health? or mental disabilities, both and. What do we mean by mental health? And let me let me start, give you all uh, something to start this with. When COVID-19, when the shutdowns came, I told people I started walking for my mental health. And I literally meant that. I was like, I'm gonna go crazy if I have to listen to all the news around this all the time. Like I'm gonna go out in nature and literally commune with God in nature. Like that was important to me for what I called my mental health. But now I need a definition. <laughs> but what do we mean by mental health? Either of you, both of you. John? That was a good move. <laughs> well, I think to, to, to go back to the idea of shalom, right? So. To experience God's shalom is to be feeling that you are welcome, that you belong, that you're in a situation where there's justice and fairness and where you are able to relate with yourself, your community, and with, uh, with well, ultimately with God. So mental health, I, I guess, is when you are in a space where you're able to hold on to that sense of meaning and purpose and relatedness, even in the midst of whatever you're going through. So, uh, you know, you could be going through a psychotic uh, uh, breakdown or you could be going through a, a very difficult uh, uh, depression. Uh, but in principle, the goal in terms of making you healthy is not necessarily to get rid of these things. In reality, some, some people live with these things for always. And, and there's nothing worse than thinking that somebody would always be ill which is what a standard definition of mental health would be. You know, if you, if you have symptoms, you're not well. Um, so it's being enabling, uh, finding structures, finding ways, finding approaches that can help people to find that sense of meaning and cohesion in the midst of whatever it is that they're going through. That's the space where mental health is, I think. So my, my main point would be it's, it's not the absence of symptoms or that you're, that you're feeling happy or that you're feeling better. It's something much deeper and much broader than that. And it's something that I think, uh, and I think when, you, when we think that way, it's a space that the church can speak into in a way that other disciplines perhaps can't speak into. So it opens up a space there for theology and practice to really do something that's, that's missing in, in other places. Before uh, Dr. Coleman uh, responds, it made me think of a quote from the, the TV show back in the 80s called Designing Women, when Dixie Carter was horrified that someone had put their, their grandfather up in the attic who had a mental dis-ease. And she said this, in the South, we let our crazy people walk among us and enjoy their tea with us. <laughs> that kind of community. Now, mm -hmm. I know how pejorative crazy people sounds, but I also get the connection between what it means to not put people aside because we think they are too broken to be in community. Dr. Coleman. I mean, I, I so appreciate what both of you are saying because, and I, I like the language I use of mental health and mental wellness um, because everybody has it, right? I mean, everyone, and it's, it's on a, it's a slide, it slides back and forth, right? It's not like we're all in the same place every day or every season of our lives. And I mean, the, the biggest challenge is with the word mental, which suggests that it's somehow distinct from physical health and physical wellness when we know they're really tied together, right? The brain is part of the body. <laughs> What's happening neurologically is part of your body. And 
um, there's such a strong connection between how one is doing physically and how one is doing mentally and vice versa. So I like to think of them as part of our overall health and our overall wellness. And they're all tight. And that's one dimension um, that overlaps me like a Venn diagram, right, with many of our other dimensions. So I will I use words like mental health challenges because sometimes we have challenges in our mental health and in our mental wellness. And sometimes those challenges can be disabling. Right? They can make it so it's difficult to function. Um, but Dr. Swinton and I agree about not classifying mental health and mental wellness by symptoms, right? Which is a big deal because that's what the medical model does, right? It, it checks off symptoms and says, if you have so many X number of them, then we treat you this way. And if you don't, then you're okay, right? And so I think we both have this emphasis on the ways in which how we are feeling, how we are doing, how we are able to manage, right? In the world is, is part of a larger picture of our overall wellness. And a lot of it has to do with how welcome we are, right, as, as you're saying, how much community we have, right, how much support we have, and how many, how many challenges we have in general, right, and the ability to be able to, um, you know, to fall without the bottom falling out. Yeah, that, that allows us to make another quick transition, which is, uh, I, I think as we talk about what role faith, and really I mean the church before I mean faith. So let me let me be clear, I'm talking about institutional care of, of the soul. Mm -hmm. So, and then that may be actually different than people's faith. I'm really clear about that. Um, but I often say, I pastored for 27 years, but I often would say to people, if you broke your leg, you would tend to it. Why are you having a problem with tending to your emotional health if, if a pill will help you? You know, but actually the, the belief that there's something different between taking care of my mental emotional health than my physical health, I think is at the core of some of the faith statements and maybe even the bad readings of of New Testament texts, especially around demon possession. Let's just put it all on the table. What do either of you want to say about what I just asked? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, I, I agree with you. And I guess I'll go with the medication one because that's such a great hot button issue to talk about. Um, because, you know, I did the initial book tour for Bipolar Faith in large Black churches. And everywhere I went, that's always a question I get. What about medication? Does it, it is it an indication of a weakness of faith, right? That one is taking medication or what are your views on it? Or can Christians take, you know, psychotropic medication and still be faithful? And um, I also, I always give out another very physical uh, analogy from a physical world. Well, you sit on a chair and you have faith that's going to support you. Sometimes it doesn't. I mean, we've all fallen off of chairs too, right? <laughs> because the chair was unstable or maybe we had a little off balance issues. So most of the time it supports you, but you have some faith that when you sit down, it will. So there has to be some faith, uh, however small, right, in whatever treatment approach you're taking, right? If you don't kind of have some belief in it, it's probably not going to work. And most things work better if you have some belief in it. Most people just tend to have, for all types of authority reasons, belief in the doctor who says you have hypertension, <laughs> right? Take the, low, take the blood pressure medication. You've broken your leg. You're going to be in pain. Take, take the painkillers right? <laughs> to say, oh, well, if this is something that needs attention, that needs support, right? Because that's how I often think of medication. It's support. It's not a cure, right? The cast does not mend your broken leg, <laughs> right? It is support, right? And if you need support, then why not take the support when you need support? You might need support for a long time. You might not need support for a long time. You don't know till you get it, right? And so, um, and I think that institutional churches would do better to remember how our mentality is part of, right, our physicality as well. And that, to remember that part of what institutional church has been is support to people. So why would we want people not to have enough support? Yeah, I agree with that completely. I, I want to I want to come back on that as well in a second. But on the issue of of uh, the demonic, I, I think it is something that we we need to talk about because it happens again and again that people ascribe the demonic to. But think about it. I mean, you know, if you look at if you take the 
uh, DSM criteria, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for, for uh, Mental Disorders, and look at the way in which something like, I don't know, schizophrenia, uh, we were talking about that, is described, and then place that against the description of the Gospels, it's just not the same. It's, 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 I mean, so at an, an empirical level, you can see quite clearly it's not the same. They're not talking about the same thing. Um, and secondly, the, uh, most of the, the demonic possession uh, that you see in the Gospels is physical. It's manifested in physical, not psychological. Else. Now, we don't usually go around telling people who have backache that it's demonic, but somehow if it's your head, if something wrong with your mind, then it's demonic. So there's all sorts of prejudices and all sorts of... And, and all we have, not all we have to do, but if we had a good conversation with psychiatrists and then enable the two people to bring their own perspectives together, then maybe we'll be able to t disentangle that without too much uh, difficulty, rather than getting our understanding of what the demonic is from Hollywood. <laughs> Go to Jerusalem, not Hollywood. Um, but Monica's point is, is absolutely right. I, I really I really resonate with that 100%. Um, and the, the way that I, I, I th always think about it is, you know, uh, what does pain do? Pain separates you from yourself, from your neighbour, and from from the, the universe. As Elaine Scarry puts it, you know, either, either you're reduced to the size of your body, or your body's expanded to the size of the universe. Um, so, pain medication reconnects you. Now, if somebody was dying of cancer, it would be unlikely for us to say, "Well, you shouldn't really be taking pain medication because you know you should really just be praying to Jesus." Uh, <clears throat> well, why was it when you have that deep psych psychological pain that people th people shift that? Because uh, uh, actually, if you think about it, medication in that context can be a reconnection. It can be a spiritual reconnection that lets you find yourself, find your neighbour, find other people. And so the problem is, I think, that we live in a culture that separates mind from body, historically and contemporarily. And we tend to prioritise, you can see this really clearly in, in mental health, but you can see it, for example, in the area of dementia care. You prioritise the mind and assume that that's this most central, important part of you. And if you start to lose that, then, you know, you lose something of your humanness. That's a cultural thing. That's something that we've made up over time. And it's not a biblical thing because the Bible doesn't think about human beings as body, body and soul is separated in that sense. It's, it's, a, it's a very holistic per understanding of the human being that the, the scripture gives to us. So maybe we should be more biblical about it. Maybe we should be more th thoughtful about the way in which we uh, uh, you know, ascribe the demonic or tell people not to uh, take medication. No, to me, it's a spiritual thing, and I think if we, we fo focus on it in that way, then a lot of these issues begin to, well, change shape a little bit. Yeah, I mean, part of what you are pointing to, both of you are pointing to, is the cultural way, and I want you to both to say more about this, the way the culture has shaped what we think of as mental health, which has nothing to do with, as you said, uh, Dr. Swinton, the DSM diagnosis, right? Uh, when I when I was a chaplain in a mental health hospital, yeah, I, I would say what color is the sky in the patient's world if they asked to see the chaplain, because I wanted to know how I was going to approach the person, not whether I was going to approach the person. You know, it's just like, you know, uh, there are some indications as to whether or not they have taken medication and are being supported and whether or not I'm, what kind of conversation we're going to have otherwise. Otherwise, this is still someone, to use the Christian language, made in the image of God. And so the idea that made in the image of God is somehow truncated if they have mental health challenges I think is a real challenge in the church and in people's understanding of faith. So this is where, uh, Dr. Coleman, your question around what, what difference, how does theology play into this, both good and for ill, and then how do we correct that? Um, there's a question about this that we'll get to in a minute, but I, what role 
I like what you said, Dr. Swinton, because when I teach Bible, I often say to my students, we're going to do something really radical. We're going to actually read it as opposed to what you think it says. We're going to figure out what it says and then engage it. So both of those questions, uh, Dr. Coleman. That makes sure I'm clear. You want to talk about culture and theology. Yeah, Okay. I do. Um, I <laughs> in 10 words or less. No, um, I, I like, you know, and oh, I think you it's can true. take 20 words. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, what Dr. Swinton says about so many of our images coming from media, right? Coming from Hollywood, right? Um, you know, we got, you know, I think I say get rid of the term demonic altogether. It's not theologically helpful um, to me. It might be sociologically helpful. We could talk about white supremacy is demonic, right? But I don't know that I find it theologically helpful. Right. I don't think there's a devil. I don't think that grace, God's grace stops somewhere. And wherever it stops is where you go, right? <laughs> where you get to hang out with demons. So in some sense, right, the theology and the culture matter in terms of how we think about mental health. Um, I think because we're talking about blackness and mental health, I'll begin with some of the cultural ideas, which are that thinking about mental health is a privilege, is seen as a privilege, is seen as a class and race privilege, I think, in the US. Um, I mean, I think if I were talking to my grandmother, she'd be like, that's white people stuff, right? Like, this is not something that black people do. You, you get it together, right? And, and you power forward. And a lot of that has to do with, with class, which as we know in this country maps loosely onto race, right? Because if you're worried about your kids' shoes fitting and people having enough food and paying the rent, you, it feels like a privilege to stop and think about, well, how do I feel about it? Right, and so which is where that's how my grandparents grew up, right? In a kind of um, poverty where thinking of one's mental health feels like a privilege. Thinking of one's mental wellness feels like a privilege because there's so many very uh, tangible survival needs at play. Um, that doesn't mean people didn't still have mental health challenges. Of course they did, right? Of course there's still um, still anguish, still grief, still you know, all the things that everyone experiences at some phase in life just because of life, let alone the more complex forms of mental health challenges, they're still there, right? It's just that we don't have time to think about it and we don't have resources to go do something about it, right? Aside from the resources we might have within our church communities, within our faith communities, right? And so I think for many people at its, at its best, faith communities were a place in which you could be embodied in your intellectual and spiritual selves and still have dignity, particularly if you came from charismatic traditions. But even if you came from traditions where spirituals are sons, this is our way of being communally, communally sorrowful, right? Um, and that there's a role for that in one's mental wellness, a place where you can kind of come together and be like, life is hard, right? And we can say that life is hard. We can say this is difficult. We can say there are sorrows. And so I think at its best, right, in, in many instantiations, there are ways in which, and I'm thinking of institutional Black churches, right, have, have been bombs for the ways in which people don't talk about or hadn't talked about or hadn't expressed their, their mental health challenges. But what we believe matters, right? If we believe it's demonic, if we believe it needs to be prayed away, if we, if we believe it's a curse or a consequence of sin, right, which are all common beliefs, right, then, um, then you're not going to talk about it. You're not going to voice it. You're not going to give, right, because you're going to be ashamed. You're going to try to get rid of it on your own. And it doesn't work that way, which it doesn't take long to find. <laughs> so I think that theology can be liberative when we break those silences, when we talk about it, when we have uh, forms and structures and ways for people to, um, to live out, <laughs> right, and to express like I said, these let the overlap of body and mind and spirit occur. Um, when we talk about the God who does know you and believe in you, but it also means we need to be cautious, I think, and careful in the ways in which we talk about suffering, in the ways in which we talk about evil, in the ways in which we talk about whether and how God does or does not alleviate suffering, uh, whether and how God answers prayer or doesn't answer prayer or in how we pray, Right, so I think our, our theology about things that don't sound like they're about mental health still make a big difference because it doesn't take anyone long to say, well, if I'm taught this and then my experience doesn't match that, then I must be out, right? I must be outside of it. I must be wrong, I must be bad, 
I must somehow be a poor person of faith, right? And what we're supposed to be doing is drawing the circle wider and bringing people in, not pushing people out. Dr. Swinton. Could you repeat the question, please? So I was asking the question about what role then does the church play in both our understanding of mental health and also theology? So not just the church writ large, although I am talking about the church and Black, and here I mean globally Black, and knowing that that's very um, desperate play in the way we think about what mental health is and what role can it play, should it play? I, yeah, I, I think, all of that made me think of something else. So I'm waiting on you. Uh, <laughs> no, the, the way I would think about, well, one way I would think about it is the church needs to be the place where people can see the world for what it is. Now, I mean, but that is, um, you know, if, if you look at the beginning, the, the first seven chapters of, of, of the book of Romans, it's very interesting the way that Paul describes both sin and evil. Because basically he talks about evil as, as something that human beings do. Um, but he also, also describes it as a kind of cognitive deficit. And so it's mistaken the things of you, or things of this world, the things that you think of yourself, for the things of God. So you're constantly focusing on yourself, constantly focusing on the things that you think you think are godly things, that you actually take your eye off God and you can no longer see God. And so you start to look at the world and you, 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 you think that you see things properly, um, but actually you, you're seeing yourself reflected in the world. Uh, and so sin is a, a cognitive deficit that prevents you from seeing the way the world the world actually is, which is why people can manipulate you know, I mean, fake news and stuff like that, because you really get sucked into that. And you can't see things. And so think about, you know, I always I was always um, uh, disturbed and moved by watching the, the killing of George Floyd and watching the policemen standing around not doing anything. Now, why were they not doing anything? Not because they were necessarily particularly bad people. It's because they couldn't see it. It was right before them, but they couldn't see it, right? So they couldn't see what was going on there. They couldn't see the racism. They couldn't see the history. They couldn't see the, the, the horror of the situation, even though they were feet away from it. Like. And, and I, so raising people's consciousness to that kind of issue and recognizing that institutional racism isn't something that, that, that is... Uh, a fallacy is something that actually means that you can't see sin within your own organization because it's become part of it. And I think it's, I can see something in relation to mental health, I see something uh, similar in, in the UK. For example, take the, um, the uh, stop and search policy that, that we have in certain parts of the country where primarily young black men are stopped by the police and searched for, for, um, uh, for weapons, right? And as part of that, it's quite well documented that they get a lot of abuse and that the police aren't always as nice to them as they, they perhaps are professional as they perhaps could have been. Now, you set up that kind of situation where people have that deep suspicion, young people, their families, their community, deep suspicion of, in this case, the police. And then you, then you, then, then you look at the statistics that suggest that um, people of colour come into the mental health system later and sometimes very often much more acutely ill. Why would that be? Well, the reason is because they're suspicious. They don't trust the services. And so, you know, you, you can focus over here, oh, it's a mental health issue, but actually it's, it's something else. It's a cultural issue. And many of us will say, that stop and search thing, it's great. It really has to be done. How many lives are we saving? But not realizing that you're actually alienating a whole group of people, which is then manifested in the mental health care system, which if you don't realize the, the, the fullness of the picture or you, can, or you can't see it, means that you're simply treating black people uh, in acute stages there. So I think what the church can do is, is to, to do what Paul says and pull back the scales and help people to see the world properly in that way. And in other words, take sin more seriously. I really like the notion of taking sin more seriously. I teach at a seminary and I, I, I know students don't even like to use the word sin <laughs> and the, the structural nature of it, the way that it frames not just uh, 
our thinking, but our order of living, where we live, how we live, with whom we we identify and how. So part of what you all, and I think it, I think you're right, Dr. Swinton, that if you are black, no matter how that shows up in the world, a hermeneutic of suspicion is built into that because of our experiences, not, not because we just started out being suspicious. We have enough historic and personal experiences for that. Um, so I guess before we start opening up to questions, I'm sure we we'll have a lot of them. I want you to talk about the stigma around this mental health for each of you in your locations, whether you're talking about Scotland and the US and how the church or any person of faith can address the stigmas, you know, uh, Dr. Coleman, you said people feel ashamed, right? Because I don't match this definition of what a faithful person is. How then can we address the stigma of mental health wherever we are, particularly for Black peoples, but really for all peoples? I mean, a part of it, I think, is to acknowledge, to begin by right, acknowledging that not the cultural experience of blackness, but the societal experience of blackness is contrary to mental wellness, right? I mean, this is what I hear you saying very well, Dr. Swinton, right? I've always kind of joked and said, anybody over anybody black over age 10 could benefit from therapy because by this point, something has happened to you that that is offensive and that it hurt, injures your sense of self, right? It, it, based on race, if not more things than that. And so I think, I mean, this is why, you know, historically, Black churches have been a safe harbor amidst racism. Um, now, there are other isms that they haven't been safe against, but have had the opportunity to say, here is a space, at least for X number of hours a day or an, a week, where you're, you don't have to be subject, right, to, to all the ills and effects of white supremacy. But we're, you know, so it's a chance to kind of rebuild what we know the world is breaking down, right? And so I think one is just saying, is acknowledging that because what I like about the conversations that we're having now about racial trauma, isn't that racial trauma is new, but that people are acknowledging that be, you know, that the effects of racism are traumatic, right? That's what I think is really great about it, right? Of course there are effects of racism, right? If you grow up in a family where your parents are also of, the oppressed race that you might identify with, they're going to teach you, right? This is how you survive. This is what you do when the police pull you over. This is how you look. This is where you put your hands, right? That kind of thing. Um, this is how you walk. This is where you look, right? <laughs> because these were elements of survival. Like I still put food in a brown paper bag when I'm driving certain places, right? Maybe you can't get served there, right? <laughs> and so these were tools of survival. This is, right, this is telling you how we wanna make sure you come home. And not everyone does that, right? Like white people don't do that <laughs> when they send their kids out or when they teach them about being a teenager or whatever the case might be. And so always having to have that awareness, that's not great for your sense of like confidence and of self-esteem and of personhood and freedom and joy. Not that we don't get to have those things, we have to be very intentional, right? To cultivate those things, I think, amidst, um, amidst what a wider society is going to do just because of one's blackness. So that's one thing I think that churches can do is to continue to be that safe place. Again, they could be safer and many are around other issues. So it's not just around race, but at least in that arena. And again, to have, and I, would, I really believe strongly in this, right? To put forth that theology. Um, where if it's, you know, how do we talk about sin, but to be really thoughtful, right? Of course, I'm always going to recommend a good process liberation perspective, um, but to be very thoughtful. And I think that's important, right? Because sometimes so often you, people are just repeating what they've heard, just repeating the phrases, the catchphrases, things that music are saying without saying, what does this say about who we believe God is? What is this saying about who we believe, who we believe people are and what is important about humanity and our souls? What is this saying about how we're going to support people? What does this say about who we believe community is designed to be, 
right? And so I think that when we have the theologies that are saying we're going to support you in the midst of your suffering, not that you're not going to suffer, we're all going to suffer, right? But that we're going to support you in the midst of that suffering. We're going to help you to get resources that if we don't have them, we're going to point you toward them, right? And we're going to not just drop you at them, but keep checking back in on you, right? Because we know how to do that. We know what to do when people's family members die. So you know what to do when people are suffering, right? To employ those same strengths that we have, I think, as, as faith communities to help people through part stages of life and to think about mental health challenges as some of the stages of life we go in and out of, right? That, that need that kind of support, continue to teach about a God who is deeply present, right? Who is, who is holding us in the midst of all of our experience, who desires our well-being, whatever that may look like for each individual or for each community. And those are some of the things that I would suggest are the ways in which what we believe, what we teach what we believe matters. Thank you, Dr. Swinton. Yeah, uh, there's not much I would add to that. I mean, obviously we have a different context because uh, the situation with guns in Scotland is is very different, and and we, you know, uh, so we we don't have that kind of concern. But the problem I think within the Scottish churches, and and you've got to remember that the United Kingdom is is, is four different countries all of which have kind of different perspectives. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're in inner city London, it'd be quite different from uh, you know, uh, inner city Edinburgh or inner city Cardiff or wherever you are, maybe. But one of the things I do notice with the Scottish churches is they don't notice racism. Uh, and when they do, it, it kind of passes them by. So for example, there's a very interesting report being done recently by the Church of Scotland. And one of the, thing, one of the things that was, was pointed out was in certain congregations, if a black minister was, for example, standing in for uh, in, a, in a congregation uh, and somebody died, the funeral director wouldn't allow the black per minister to take the service. So they, they go looking for a white minister and sometimes families would do the same thing. Um, and so that was quite a, that was quite a shock for for uh, for our church to, to notice these kinds of things. And likewise, when we spoke, at, when the, our, we have, every year we have a general assembly and something like a hundred and something people voted against black, the idea of supporting Black Lives Matter. Um, now, nobody really knows what that means because it, it may be that they just didn't like the politics of it. It may be they didn't understand it. Maybe they just uh, weren't listening to the question. But the point being, there's a significant dimension within our church of uh, uh, around uh, issues around race that people are not addressing or thinking about. Now we're in the process of, of working on that. So my own church is an, an equality and diversity group which come into existence or is coming into existence. Well, it is in existence and it's doing really good work. Uh, beginning to raise people's consciousness to this, the fact that you know invisible racism is almost worse than visible racism because you know people are hurt and broken without even knowing about it. So from my, pers my perspective, within my, at least within my denomination, looking inwards is the place to go before we make big proclamations about what we should be, uh, other people should be doing on the outside and in inverted commas. Yeah, I like that notion of looking inwards. I was with uh, a multicultural church over the weekend. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, they're good people. And they're trying to do this work um, around anti-racism. And I do mean trying, they are trying, but they're trying to do it in a way, and they would agree with what I'm about to say, where everybody's safe and nobody, you know, nobody, everybody's comfortable, nobody's offended, which essentially means you don't end up doing the work because white people don't want to be offended for the history that white supremacy has impugned on all of us. And so then you end up doing sort of um, symbolic things, but not deep work. And I think as you talk about mental health, whether you're talking about moral injury or uh, Dr. Coleman, which is what I kind of heard you alluding to, or just the, the injury that racism cuts across the globe. I mean, across the globe, anti-black, 
racism is a whole different kind of racism, but racism and colonialism across the globe is just stunning to me. And that's the only word I can think of. As we, as we turn toward these questions that are being raised, I'd like for you both to kind of make a declaration about at these intersections of global blackness, mental health, and faith that is also a charge to people who say they love God and want to be God's people in the world, the vicar of Christ in the earth, the intercessory presence of God to the whole of creation. What would you say as a kind of final statement before we go to the questions at those intersections of global blackness, mental health, and faith? Well, I'll, I'll, I think one statement, but what, what did come to mind as you were talking. Oh, you can do that. it any kind of way you want to. I say one <laughs> statement. I mean a final kind of yeah. before we open up to the questions. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this is, you know, you, as you are a scholar of preaching and there's very common advice giving to preachers that our job as preachers is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable, right? So no one's comfortable all the time, right? But no one's supposed to be afflicted all the time either. Right. And so what really, you know, I think comes to mind is, you know, for those who are experiencing mental health challenges, you know, what what is comforting? Right? What, what comfort can we can we give? And sometimes that may mean, all right, you know, race only spaces. If you're in amongst mixed community, that's what's comforting. Sometimes it is, you know, casseroles, right? On the, right, we bring by casserole every week in many communities. Like this is what you need, right? Sometimes it's a, a really good referral. Um, but what is, what, how do we provide comfort, right? And many people find comfort in um, what feels particularly grounding and culturally familiar, right? There, there can be some comfort in that and the strengths of our particular culture. Sometimes it's a church culture, sometimes it's our, our race culture, right? Um, but that also means a bit of afflict afflicting, right? Those who are comfortable, because being called to community is not always easy, right? Um, I mean, to me, one of the best antidotes <laughs> to, to mental health challenges and for those who live with it is Isolation is what makes it so difficult, right? What we experience, feeling like you're the only one who knows that you're experiencing, that no one understands it, that you're experiencing something by yourself. And being in community is what heals that. I mean, that's partly what's made um, so much of the pandemic so difficult for so many people was because they're pulled out, right, of community and pulled, you know, and pulled into isolation. And so, but being community is not easy, right? Just it's like, it's like being family. It means you have to get used to difference. It means you have to, um, you know, learn how to see the best in people who have hurt you. It means you have to practice forgiveness, right? I mean, there are a lot of things about being in community that aren't easy, even though it's deeply rewarding. And so I think also practicing that, not acting like it's easy all the time, right? Saying, hey, this is hard. Um, I mean, there are traditions, I think of Methodist traditions that have love feasts. Right, and part of that idea is to say, like, let's all make up, and we know that once a month we need to make up because at some point in the last month we've offended each other, and we're all going to make up before we take this bread. Right? I mean, that there are so many ways to ritualize, like, what it means to really be in community, and so I, for me, I think those are some of the best ways we can try to, you know, live our best at these intersections is, and not to let our speaking as you know, someone who identifies as black, right? Not to let white supremacy have a hold on our seeking out our wellness, right? You know, this way in which sometimes we're taught, don't let them see you sweat, right? Don't show your weaknesses in front of other people, right? Where you're cutting off your nose to spite your face, to use the idiomatic expression, right? You're standing in your own way of your own wellness because of how you think other people perceive black and white people, right? <laughs> when, no, go get your wellness, right? Go, go do what you have to do um, and, you know, find people who are going to understand or at least account for, right, the experiences that you're bringing and the commitments you're bringing um, as you seek out your wellness. Um, I would just say two things. 
maybe we need to to shift our approach a little bit uh, in two ways. Um, when you're the example for you gave there, Valerie, of of trying to be reconciling uh, is, is is doesn't work. <laughs> And it's a little bit like uh, some forms of interreligious dialogue where you know you have got to cut off all the sharp edges of your religion so that you can find a center place where nobody's offended. So I'm, 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 recently I've been thinking maybe to, instead of thinking about reconciliation, which sometimes just means every, if difficult things get pushed down, think about conflict transformation. So you know, there's always going to be conflict, uh, uh, but the question is whether it can be transformed into something good or whether it's allowed to fester into something bad. So rather than simply trying to find that safe space, learning how to live with, learning to work with conflict and allowing it to, to become a catalyst for good and a catalyst for change. That means a slightly different model, a slightly different angle about the way that we approach one another. Uh, and it, need, it requires a certain kind of honesty and a certain kind of openness. And Monica's speaking to that. Um, the second thing is, I think, uh, shifting the debate from, from uh, or not shifting the debate, but taking seriously the, the fact that in John's gospel, Jesus says, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends, right? So friendship becomes the model of discipleship there. And so the question is, um, would you as a Christian disciple treat your fellow Christian disciple in this way? Um, uh, 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 and if, if the answer to that is yes, then you, you have to become friends. Because you can't treat your friends badly, you can't be prejudiced against your friends, and you can't be prejudiced against your, your disciples because it's, it's like a it's like it's like you, you're part of the body of Christ, but you 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 choose to be a cancer cell. You know, you choose to just destroy everything around you there. Um, so, taking seriously discipleship and friendship uh, as as a mode, as a way of thinking about our brothers and sisters. Uh, and thinking seriously about how we can use conflict as a space for transformation is at least a beginning point for, to overcome the, these kind of things. And then you have a community where people can feel safe, where people can articulate that they have mental health challenges, they can articulate that things are difficult, they can articulate all the things, but if you haven't got that safe space, you can't do it. But I think these things begin to give us a, 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 the possibility of creating that kind of safe space. Yeah, I, I appreciate both of your uh, sort of final volleys around that. I think I've given up on the notion of safe space and kind of embraced. I wish I knew the name of the scholar. Her name is going out of my head now. The woman who wrote around brave space, that we build the capacity to be brave and therefore to be transformed. Because for the same reasons uh, that none of us are are or uh, comfortable all the time. Safety isn't always the thing either. I, when I was doing trans, some work with some women ministers, I was like, oftentimes we don't feel safe, but not feeling safe is not the same thing as not being safe. So you have to know the difference between when you are actually not safe, as opposed to when you just don't feel safe. I'm not saying that that's not an important feeling. I'm just saying you have to be able to distinguish between those, those things. And sometimes you have to be brave in the face of your own fears and lack of feeling safe. Okay, I'm gonna go to the questions. Now, some people have been writing questions in the chat, so I'm gonna try to pick those up, but I'm gonna start with the one who followed uh, the rules and put it in the Q&A, cause you know, cause I'm a professor and I kind of favor those students first. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if this is as much a question as a statement, but I would want you to, to speak to it. Um, well, it is a question. Is it really multiple identities in other countries or even in the U.S.? Or does phenotype tend to win out most of the time, even though the individuals see themselves as multiple? White skin privilege tends to win out. So then what? What do you say to that? That's the question. Well, I do think there is such a thing as white skin privilege. Um, and that like I said race is and blackness is loosely right around race. But if you put people together color by color, like a Crayola crayon box, 
right? There might be people who are browner than myself who identify as white for all types of reasons, right? And that is their cultural identification as well as their maybe political savvy, right? Then and, and vice versa, right? So I think that there are, sorry, there are issues of colorism that are that are always at play, right? Uh, I mean, this is how you can have a phenomenon such as passing um, in the U.S. because it's not completely around 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 color, right? So there is definitely a sense of color of brownness, right? But there are different kinds of brownness as well that aren't black, right? There there is South Asian brownness, there's Latino brownness. I mean, there's all kinds of brownness as well that does not get the same, I'll use the word venom here, as anti, same venom as anti-blackness, which a light-skinned black person may experience differently than say a brown-skinned South Asian for again, all types of reasons. So I think there is a correlation with phenotype, but it's not a direct correlation, I think is what I'm trying to get at. Dr. Swinton, did you wanna add anything to that? No, I'm not, that, that's. Great. Okay, so the next question, I'm going to actually throw this at you, Dr. Swinton, and then Dr. Coleman, if you want to respond to it as well, feel free. How do you think one's mental wellness affects, impacts one's biblical interpretation, specifically for those who are experiencing depression and or anxiety? How do you think the disease process itself affects this? Uh, that's, a, that's a really important and good question. Uh, question. Um, the purpose of scripture is to enable us to, to know God and to love God more fully. And so that's what it's intended to do. And when Jesus says that some of the law and prophets is to know God, uh, know, know, uh, to love God, love our neighbor and love ourself. And scripture primary intention is to help us to do that. Um, when we're going through difficult times, uh, we tend to or we can develop a negative hermeneutic, a way of interpreting scripture that is dangerous. And it actually stands against that intention of scripture. Because you'll just, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll focus on the Psalms of, of um, imprecation, or you'll focus on the end of Psalm 88, darkness is my only companion, and then you'll, you'll, you'll ruminate and ruminate and ruminate and that. And that's not what scripture is intended to do. And so at some points, I mean, Richard Baxter is quite interested in this. He says that sometimes you have to just, uh, when you're going through periods of melancholy, you have to just put scripture to one side and allow others to read parts of it to you, to, med to pleasant meditations, to find places where you'll find encouragement and find you where you'll find uh, places to grow. Uh, and then eventually, once you're, you're, you're uh, well, you can go back and read it in the way you did. And the way he puts it is, uh, if somebody broke a leg, you wouldn't t tell them to stand up in it and walk about in it. Like, And the same thing spiritually, when you're, when you're broken in that sense, you don't, you don't march around in it. So I think that that's, that's the way I would think about scripture in that context. Dr. Coleman, did you want to add anything? Okay, so I'll I'll kick the next question to you, and then Dr. Swinton, if you want to add on to this, feel free. Uh, how should mental health interventions or program for historically marginalized communities look different when provided by a black church community versus a white church community? Should there be a difference between the interventions and the programs? Um. Yes. I would say, um, should there be, I don't know if should's a word, but can there be? Yes. Because I think some of our cultural resources that are healing, and we have different cultural resources to draw upon, right? So I mentioned earlier, um, and I talk a lot about in my work, what I think are the power of the spirituals, right? Which are, it's, it's, they're African, it's African American cultural material. Um, it comes out of the crucible of African American experience. And that I believe are very grounding for um, communal expression and acknowledgement, and and holding those plate, holding what what some would consider uncomfortable spaces, right, um, within faith community, right, countering that idea that we should always be happy Christians, right? Spirituals are like, no, no, you don't have to be. We can we can tarry here, right? And that's that's cultural, right? Not all communities tarry with spirituals. They have other things they do, right? So um, East Asian communities have particular cultural traditions. 
South Asian communities, would have a different cultural tradition that are that are familiar and that could be healing, that could be helpful, and you should invoke those, right? I think even to say white church community, what um, I, you know, what Irish do might be different than what others do. Right? I'm thinking of um, having worked in Lutheran schools, which come from these very Scandinavian cultural communities, right? So there's a kind of Scandinavian and cultural way that Lutherans comfort each other. It involves casseroles and other foods, right? Um, that you would only find in those communities. And that's not about whiteness, right? It's about what's culturally comforting. And so I think that what, what can be different are what are those cultural resources we draw upon, right? Another one I would say from African communities, African-American communities is this embodiment. I mean, you ask any scholar of black religion and they'll talk about, well, why do we call it black religion? Because it's a kind of embodiment. Well, even if you're not from the most charismatic traditions, but there's still a kind of embodiment in worship, right? <laughs> that, um, that I think can be very healing when your mind and your body and your spirit feel very disjointed. It's a, it can be a very healing process. And if that's part of your tradition and part of your culture, this is a great time to invoke it, right? A great time to do a laying on of hands if a laying on of hands is part of what you do culturally, right? You can't just pull it from someone else's culture and try it here. It's not gonna work. It's not gonna be effective. It's not going to have that comfort or familiarity. So I think it's pulling on those cultural resources that can be healing that are particular, right, to, to individual culture that I said map loosely around race, but not wholly. Yeah, that's a great answer, yeah. There's a really interesting book by, uh, written by Ethan Waters, it's called Crazy Like Us. Uh, and basically it's, it's a book about the way in which American psychiatry is colonizing the world with its own criterion. Uh, and so, for example, the, he uses the, ex the example of the tsunami back uh, the, 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 where you know, thousands and thousands of people were, were killed and damaged and traumatized. Um, and he points out that America sent in counselors to try to deal with that, the post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, but that wasn't the way in which that culture dealt with trauma. They dealt with it not as one-to-one -one individual things, but as a community. They had their own healing resources, they had their own stuff that was going on in the midst of that. And by busting in this or taking in this, this alien model, you actually end up perhaps not doing as much good as you, you want to, and maybe even doing some harm. Um, and I, I, there's, a, there's a danger that when it comes to uh, psychological uh, approaches to mental health within churches that we do the same thing, that we think there's a kind of Eurocentric model that then can just simply be applied to different places. And that, you know, there may be quaint ideas in different cu cultures, but actually there's a central way in which we all should be looking at. I think what Monica says is absolutely right. It, it's respecting the cultural resources of the different communities and recognizing that European culture is a culture, it's a cultural perspective. It's, it's sometimes invisible to, to, to the power that that has, but realize that that's no more a cultural perspective or no less than what you'll find in a Korean church or what you find in a Chinese church or an African American church or whatever it is. And then you can get the healing resources from these different communities to click into action and hopefully find contextually appropriate healing for people. I think um, that Dr. Monica gets at what you were saying about the possibility of having affinity groups in multicultural contexts, you know, because, because listen, I grew up in the deep South in the USA. That means something. <laughs> I mean, it means something. And it means something differently from uh, Midwest Nice, where I am right now. It just means something. And it means something very differently. And they don't always translate across the regions. And so I, I think that kind of cultural humility of knowing that you may not know what is helpful to someone is also a way to start going to resources. This is where I think the book of Job is really helpful in the first part of the, the book of Job. Sit with it. <laughs> because if you can sit with it without theologizing about it, you'll be a better friend disciple friend than making up stuff based on your own discomfort. Either one of you want to say something to that before I go to these last couple of questions. <laughs> All right, there's a question here. I'm going to try to read the whole thing and you figure out the question. 
Um, what do you make of the language of prophetic apocalyptic around race and or disability? In my experience, many black people experience racism as demonic and recognize that many white counterparts can't see it because white supremacy enslaves the cultures which favor whiteness. I know that some theologians see blackness as not only the contradiction of the, the order of whiteness and racial categoriz categorization, but they also see blackness as apocalyptic because it's the kind of Christ-like sociality, which is itself the destruction of the order of whiteness. Okay, categories by color. Thus, blackness is a possibility which can include all colors because it never set up as a category by the optic regime of race. Could we see blackness as apocalyptic mm. as well as prophetic? Mm. That's a lot. You don't have long to answer that question, but try it. <laughs> um, I'll give it a go, which might be unsatisfying and probably different, it may be different than what uh, Dr. Swinton would say. Um, one, I think part of the question relies on ontological notions of blackness, which I don't personally hold, although there are black theologians that do. So since we're talking to me, I will break out of the ideas of ontological notions of blackness, right? Because then you have to say to be black is X. And it tends to, in, I find, and you know, drawing largely on Victor Anderson's work and those who've come after him in that tradition, it eradicates some pretty important differences and distinctions and beauties about the experiences of Blackness. So that's one part I'll say there. I, I also am not favoring the term demonic. Um, I'm good with sin, but, um, but I don't like the term demonic because I think, one, I think it's got way too much baggage on it, but it also assumes that there's a devil or a counter force to God that is equal or near equal to God. And as a process theologian, we just don't do that. We don't have a hell, we don't have a devil, right? We believe the world carries enough sin for us to wrangle with that we don't need to ascribe it to another power, right? So one, I'll also grid it demonic. <laughs> and we talk about apocalyptic. Um, I think eschatologically, um, well, it, there, there we hold the course that there is a realm beyond our realm, right? Whether we call it an ancestral realm, we call it heaven, in which things are more whole or more complete or more ideal than they are here on earth. But as a liberationist, I'm a little bit more interested, actually a lot more interested, in how it is that we take that ideal and try to live it out here in this realm, right? This time-bound, temporal, earthly realm that we're in. And so in that sense, right, where we know that there is a broad, expansive, detailed to understand and nuanced understanding of Blackness. Um, what role does Blackness have in the ways in which we try to live out an eschatological vision here on Earth? Well, and what is the role of it in disability? I think when we're looking at our eschatological hopes as a way of eradicating that which is bad, for lack of a more complex moral term, right, which is, I think is good, then I like to think of that bad as injustice, not that bad as whatever normal would be in disabled being eradicated, right? <laughs> like the very common expression is, does God, do deaf people here in heaven will know God's signs, right? It's this idea, but if we have this idea that there is a normal and <laughs> that um, something deviates from that normal and we're shooting for that normal, I think that's a problem. I think what we're shooting for is justice. And <laughs> what we're seeking to eliminate is injustice, wherever that is found, whether it's around ability, whether it's around race, whether it's around gender, whether it's around sexual orientation. And that our goal and our prophetic work is to try to bring out as much of that vision here on earth where we are in our communities as we imagine it to be idealized in another realm. Yeah, cisgender heterosexual ableism is its own issue. Dr. Swinton? Nope, nothing to say. I was really <laughs> Okay, I'm checking to see if there are other questions. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't see them there. So we're, there's no need to wrangle. My grandmother would say, seems like we've, we've chewed all the fat out of that. So there's no need to keep wrangling around it. I want to, as the Dean of MTSO, thank you both very much for what has for me been a very generative conversation. And also I got some good books that I probably shouldn't buy, but I'm gonna. <laughs> because you know, we all have our addictions and books are mine. <laughs> um, 
So I, I want to thank you on behalf of the institution and those who've joined us in this conversation for being with us today. And for those of you who are online and also to those of you, I want to invite you to our um, conversation or our lectures on uh, November next week, two weeks from now, two and three, where Dr. Juan Floyd Thomas will lecture on the 100 years of uh, the Tulsa massacres Christianity at the crossroads and what it means for us to reflect on, on how faith had an impact on, on violence in this country and beyond. I think it's called From Tulsa to Black Lives Matter. So I hope you will join us for 7 p.m. on November 2nd and 1 p.m. on November 3rd Eastern time for those of you who are with us. So thank you both again and have a great rest of the, I don't know what time zone you're in right now, afternoon, evening <laughs> for this time. Thank you very much.